Okay, welcome back after the coffee break. Um, we will have a panel before we break for lunch, uh, to which I will, you're all invited to. Uh, lunch will be the same place as we had yesterday, down behind the lobby. Um, so, for this panel, titled Competition Law and the Freedom to Conduct a Business, we have Professor Peter Miloski Bodnar from Karoli University, Hungary, and uh, Julia Yerneva, partner at Vilgertz, who will talk to us about this topic. The floor is yours. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. As you can see, we have two topics, uh, the competition law and freedom to conduct a business, and we would like to show the connection between these two topics. Let's first uh, coming back to the history, uh, because uh, this uh, freedom of conduct belongs to the fundamental rights of the European Union. As uh, you can see, maybe uh, the Rome Treaty didn't contain any express reference to human rights, and there were a long procedure uh, to uh, get the today's situation. I didn't want to go to, into the details, but. I have to mention that the first that during the first etap of court practice was very important to find uh, what kind of rights, what kind of freedoms uh, are uh, in the European Union. And later, of course, uh, the Nice European Council uh, announced the fundamental rights, the Charter of the Fundamental Rights. At that time, it was was not uh, obligatory. But today is it from the Lisbon Treaty. The structure of the EU Charter, you can see seven titles. The first six titles contains the different rights and freedoms. Uh, the seven means general provisions. For us, uh, the title two is the most important because it contains the freedoms. Let's go to this title two. Uh, as you can see, there are 14 different freedoms and rights. Uh, the Article 16 contains the freedom to conduct a business. It is very close to the Article 17, right to property. Uh, courts uh, generally uh, means that these two articles on the same case, the, the, you are, the, the court used these uh, two freedoms together. What is the content of the freedom to conduct the business? Uh, we have different sources to find the contact. Uh, first is the same, uh, the text of the Article 16. 16, the European Court cases on freedom to conduct the business. And let me very shortly uh, mention some things about the Hungarian Constitution. Text of Article 16 means that the freedom to conduct a business is recognized, which uh, means that it's a declaration and uh, the Charter doesn't elaborate on the content of the freedom to conduct business. Uh, it's more important for us to know something about the court practice. Uh, Having read the text of different decisions, I would like two approaches, a more general and a more detailed one. This is the more general approach. It's uh, mentioned a lot of uh, cases. The freedom to conduct a business includes uh, the right for any businesses to be able to freely use within the limits of its liability for its own acts the te economic, technical, and financial resources available to it. So it's a little bit more knowledge than the declaration, but uh, which is really uh, useful for me and for this topic, the uh, more detailed approach, which uh, states three different elements of this freedom. Uh, the first element, freedom to ex exercise an economic or commercial activity. The second is the freedom of contract, and the third is free competition. So uh, the free com competition uh, close uh, the two areas of our lectures. Um, very shortly about the Hungarian constitution, which uh, 
contains the right to conduct business and freedom of competition in the same sentence, uh, not only recognized but supports uh, as the text contains. And uh, uh, the Hungarian Constitutional Court practice uh, state uh, maybe one uh, addition to the uh, European Court uh, statement. I mean uh, that anyone can become an entrepreneur. So the uh, part of the uh, freedom is absolutely at the beginning uh, to to become an entrepreneur is belong to the part. Let me uh, jump, and uh, I missed uh, the limitation topic, uh, and I go to the second uh, areas of lecture, the, the competition. When we uh, talking about the competition, generally we are thinking on prohibition and concerted practices, the abuse of uh, dominant position, uh, sorry, and, and, uh, and uh, merger, uh, but I would like to mention the unfair competition also, and liberalization, which is a special area of competition law. I would like to mention some cases about uh, this topic. Uh, as far as the cartel uh, is concerned, the prohibition of concerted practices, legislative provisions and block exemption regulations have to uh, find what kind of connection uh, are there between uh, the main uh, freedoms and uh, these parts of the uh, area of competition law. The connection between the two freedoms is uh, very close. Uh, they serve the same purposes alongside each other. Their connection is so close that uh, ha they have almost grown into one by now. The question may be asked whether these two kinds of freedom could contradict each other. Is it at all possible that one, any one of the rules of competition collides with Article 16 of the Charter? At first glance, we might think that the rules of competition cannot violate the principle of freedom to conduct business, since the freedom of competition is a part of the freedom to conduct a business, as we can uh, so uh, from the court practice of the European Union court. After the creation of an enterprise, during the course of its operation, we can only talk of the freedom to conduct a business if it is free to compete. I have not met a single European case in which a regulation concerning competition was claimed to be unduly restrictive to the freedom to conduct a business and thereby to collide with Article 16. Nevertheless, I, can't, I cannot exclude the possibility that such cases will be initiated in the future. Therefore, I try to enumerate of a theoretical basis all the, possibility, all the possibilities upon which the argument can be made. In principle, the general rule of harmony between the rules prohibiting the restriction of competition and the freedom to conduct a business could be damaged if the antitrust law would, by exception, become rule uh, contradictory to another ingredient of the general fundamental rights, namely to freedom to contract. Let me mention two cases from the Hungarian uh, legal practice. Um, both cases are connected to the liberalization uh, rules, what I mentioned uh, earlier. The Hungarian state tried to artificially create uh, competition on the telecommunications sector through a concession. It was the beginning of the 90s. The territory of the country was divided 20 uh, different districts, and tender had to be submitted to obtain the right to the provide landline services. However, with the sole 
exception of one district, all of the tenders were won by the state-owned telephone company. The previously incumbent company tried to acquire the right to providing landline uh, telephone services even in the region where a Swiss company uh, offered the best tender. However, the competition authority didn't allow the agreement drafted by the parties to be concluded because it would have restored the very monopoly in the whole country that the tender procedure aimed to eliminate. The party's contractual freedom was restricted by the decision of the competition authority in defense the result of liberalization serving potential competition. The events leading up to another case was the breaking up of the state railways uh, company, which had previously a monopoly. As a result of liberalization, the public company was divided into three independent companies. One of uh, these three was the MAF Cargo, which performed freight transport, uh, had the most chance of profitable operation, and it was also the company that had the most to worry that competitors might appear on the freight transport market. MAF Cargo drew up long-term contracts with its previously largest customers, wishing to tie them itself for 10 years, thereby forcing the potential competitors to compete with each other for customers, uh, constituting a smaller segment of the market. In this case, the competition authority also considered that defense of competition more important than the protection of contractual freedom. My next topic is the importance of respecting the rights of freedom to conduct a business in terms of competition legislation. Certain areas of uh, the competition law uh, should be analyzed uh, individually from the point of view whether they may contain legal norms that may violate Article 16. The first uh, area is the unfair competition. The rules uh, the unfair competition uh, govern how competition can take place. The requirement of fair competition provides for the possibility that market conditions become identical for each enterprise. In my opinion, uh, there is a little probability for someone to raise a claim in the hope of success that any of the law prohibiting specif specifically listed cases of unfair competition collides with Article 16 of the Charter. The problem is in this area uh, is that the compliance with the prohibition of unfair competition is uh, not checked by the competition authority. Legal actions has to be initiated against those engaging in such, such practices. However, the cost and the time requirements of a court litigation may dissuade many enterprises with fair conduct from initiating self-actions. As a result, unfair behavior often remain without consequences. Each chamber could do much in order to exclude enterprises conducting unfair practices from their ranks. The spreading of the professional ethics codes also can help. Let's move another uh, topic, uh, the cartel topic, as you can see. Uh, the norms, no norms prohibiting uh, cartels can violate Article 16, in my understanding. In principle, member states' legislation listing typical types of cartel may conflict with Article 16. If it qualifies as cartel such borderline cases when the prohibition with respect to practices unduly restrict the freedom to conduct a business. It mainly occurs in Eastern and Central European member states of the EU that following the end of decade-long era without uh, competition regulation, 
The national legislative body felt compelled to create a wider list of what practices were to be considered cartels in order to help and orient judicial practice. It cannot be excluded that in the future a statement of crime may assert in connection with certain practices on such list that the prohibition of that particular practice violates Article 16. The block exemption regulation essentially promote the freedom to conduct business by clarifying the boundaries between lawful and unlawful practices and permitting practices inherently considered to be cartels. Considering the freedom of competition and freedom to uh, conduct a business, however, it could be problematic if certain practices are unduly uh, prohibited by putting them on the blacklist, certain practices are unduly declared as possible to be pr prohibited by putting them on the grey list, and last but not least, the period of time within which a practice is considered lawful is determined to be unduly brief. <coughs> Having regard to the fact that Commission reviews the block ex exemption regulation every 10 years, there is only a small chance that they may contain unduly strict provisions. Uh, nevertheless, one or another of member states may be late in incorporating uh, European registration in their national law. In this case, that a new, Euro new European block uh, exemption regulation exempts more types of behavior from the prohibition of unconcerted uh, practices than before, a delay on the part of the member states will result in a situation where some blacklist uh, regulation continue to remain in force. The abuse of dominant position no norms uh, prohibiting the abuse of dominant position can violate Article 16. I do not consider it probable that the criteria to be taken into consideration in deciding whether an enterprise can be considered having a dominant position might violate Article 16. And the national regulation on the member state uh, listing the typical cases of abuse of dominant position might be in conflict with Article 16, similarly than the cartel case. Merger. The folly following do not violate Article 16. The competence of the European Commission or the competition authority of the member states uh, to examine the merger of business on the grounds on competition law and the competence of the European Commission and the uh, competition authority of member states to prohibit or restrict fusion or approve it subject to re remedies. But uh, there are some possibilities uh, for the conflict uh, between the two freedoms. That the following might conflict with Article 16, a situation where legislation might allow the inspection of merger on the ground of competition law too widely, for example, by unduly uh, extending inspection to small enterprises. A situation where legislation allows for unduly long terms for conducting the inspection for European Commission or the competition authority of the member states, thereby keeping the enterprises concerned in uncertainty for too long. A situation where the European Commission or competition authority or another legislative body of a member state passes a binding norm which allows the for the prohibition or restriction of merger or makes it approval subject to remedies in cases where it exceeds proportionality. And uh, in the end, there is a uh, questioned uh, topic, a situation where the amendment of a law orders that in the future that merger shall not be implemented until the competition authority of the member state has concluded in inspection. 
In Hungary, in the past, mergers were allowed to be implemented before the conclusion of the competition authority process, uh, so-called gun jumping or early implementation. As of July 1st, 2014, the amended Hungarian uh, Competition Act prohibits the preliminary implementation of merger. This is the standstill obligation situation. In a study, in a Hungarian author stated that prohibition can be considered as a type of restriction of the freedom to conduct a business. So thank you very much for your attention. I would like to give uh, the floor, Julia Jernjeva. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, it is my uh, honor to uh, be here today. Uh, and um, I think that I'm uh, amazed by, by big data. I'm amazed at how big is the fuss about it and how big is the problem and how, how much academic potential there is to write and try to suggest how the world will change and what are these new rules that we should be afraid of and, and how should we um, spend more money on lawyers, economists and, and, and all of that to face and solve the problems that we don't really even know what they are and, and what will that be of this, li of, of this world. In fact, uh, how will this big data um, impact us in the coming years? Um, the geniuses uh, in the high-tech sector, uh, they, they say that in about 30 years, the world will be different and we will be governed by these uh, intellectual machines. So we're all afraid and we don't know what to do with that. Now, I, w I don't want to focus on the privacy uh, questions here, okay? I only want to know um, where is the money, where is the trouble, and what can we do? Shall we do something? Should we adopt new rules? Uh, should we be afraid of new things, these unknown uh, problems? Now. What they normally talk about in relation to the big data and uh, doing business are basically two things. One thing is this uh, private data being as a currency or being as an asset that everybody wants uh, and that will magically help us or some specific companies to become even bigger, even richer and uh, uh, it take all of the possible profit from, from us. Now, the second thing is the Internet of Things, something we, we, we are told about, something we are expecting to see in every day. Uh, this is this amazing future that comes to us from the uh, screens of the, of the TV. They show us uh, how everything will be interconnected and how our lives will be um, amazingly simpler. Now, at the same time, we're afraid to see that this Internet of Things, this interconnectivity, uh, will uh, create super dominant uh, entities that will be globally uh, dominant or monopolistic, and, uh, and there is no more room for those small startups, uh, for, for the rights of the consumer. We're, we're afraid of that. Now, therefore, I wanted to look at the main points that are normally discussed in uh, antitrust or competition law uh, in relation to the big data. So how big is this uh, problem? Now first, that uh, first rule uh, that, that um, smaller competitors are necessarily willing to try to apply is this essential facilities doctrine. Because according to the essential facilities doctrine, if you have something that the other people cannot uh, reproduce or it's too expensive or it's technically impossible, then those others might ask you and you shall give the access uh, to this uh, facility. Now, the doctrine emerged in relation to railways, airports, um, telecommunication networks, the things that cost a fortune to create and that uh, sometimes even technically impossible, impossible to replicate. 
Now, is big data this essential facility? Is the data that uh, Facebook holds the essential facility? And can competitors or clients ask the uh, access to this data? This is very hard question to answer. We will see, and this, in my opinion, one of the rarest points where competition law will have to adapt to the uh, specifics of the big data. One of the reasons is that, imagine there is a box that holds uh, all of my uh, personal data. Now, necessarily Facebook has parts of this uh, box. The same parts, let's face it, are uh, held by Google, the identical parts of this, uh, of this box. So if we're trying to evaluate what is the value what is, uh, of the Facebook uh, box, what is the market power that they have, this market power is identical in some points to the one that Google has. So where is this essential facility? Where does it sit? Where, where is it located? How can we uh, say that you have the right to ask the, the access to Facebook, but uh, then what? Why didn't you ask it from Google? So the essential facilities doctrine, it will necessarily work here, but, but there are practical difficulties here. Plus, the data, what is this data that, that we care about from the point of view of competition law? We don't necessarily... Uh, well, we care, but we are not that much interested in the privacy aspects, and we are not necessarily interested in seeing that there is just a bulk of uh, different data. You need to have a tool to ensure that you can extract profit. There is a use from that data that you have. This data must be capable of being analyzed. It should uh, give you a competitive advantage. It must be a special data. So, for example, if I would have personal access to all of the Facebook databases, how rich would I become? Not really, because I don't know what to do with this data. Now, if uh, there is somebody else who knows what to do with this data, what is it that they should be asking um, the access to? The big file? The, this box? or the tools that can help uh, the third party to actually make use of that data. Because we understand that there is a big difference between an Excel file and a database that is capable of creating meaningful reports. So those questions need to be evaluated very accurately. Another point uh, that will necessarily uh, be very, very topical in relation to the big data is the tying and bundling. Uh, the world has changed and from this very classical example of a Malaysian uh, case where sugar and rice uh, had to necessarily be bought together, you couldn't just buy one because the dominant <coughs> entity was uh, trying to grow its market share on the other market. So, those are the simple, beautiful examples from the past. The future will bring something different. All of those smart things that we own, how much incentive it is uh, for the uh, manufacturer of a uh, smart TV, um, TV sets to start doing the smart cooking machines because, for example, how much would you pay, I know I would pay, uh, for the idea that I'm watching this uh, cooking show and at the same time somebody, this machine is preparing the same pasta for me. Because, you know, I'm always hungry when I watch those things. And I would buy more, I uh, would pay more for, for this kind of thing. And, and if you know how to connect those, you will ask more money or you will say that your cooking machine can work, but only provided that you own the same TV set. Of course, this is, uh, this is violation, but the question is how clever they are, how clever they will become in trying to hide, of course, this, this tying of different products and uh, hiding all those real life terms and conditions on this. Now, there are, of course, pro-competitive motivations. There are, there are so many uh, reasons why this tying and bundling will necessarily enhance competition. It will uh, allow us to make those uh, breakthroughs because, as I already said, I want the cooking machine to be connected to the TV. 
And this is something that we need. Of course, it is in some terms uh, less expensive to make uh, those two products together because if, even simply you need uh, plastic to make uh, both of those pro uh, products, right? Simple, very sim simple things. So there are good and bad things about tying and bundling and what the authorities will uh, face this risk of overreacting um, applying too many restrictions, saying that oh, you can't really tie those two different products, they're so different and, and you're limiting competition in another market. Now, if they will be too eager to prohibit, what will the impact be on innovation? It will definitely not be a positive uh, type of impact. Now, what other effects can we have uh, from, uh, from these big data uh, rules? There is this um, fridge that I really want to buy. Uh, it's, I think it's Samsung or something, and it is a super clever fridge. If I'm at work and I don't remember if I have milk in the fridge, so apparently I can go online and check what's inside my fridge. Or if my kid is at home, I need to know if he has eaten the soup or in fact he's just sitting there and eating the ice cream, right? Amazing. But then imagine it starts sending me notes. There is no more milk in the fridge, please buy the milk. Or you can tap here and get it delivered tomorrow morning. Delivered from whom? delivered from the retailer that is owned by the manufacturer of this uh, refrigerator? Most probably, right? Or the prices will be better, or the uh, retailers will start talking to the refrigerator manufacturer saying, hey, how much will it cost to, to have my amazing uh, price offer sent directly to the phones of your specific customers. You know, there is, there is so much potential for this coordinated uh, behavior on the market. It, it is amazing how much potential there is. Um, and there is a potential that some of us will be starting to receive less information on the discounts. Because if I am a daily drinker of a Moyette Chandon, and if I uh, every week, just like yesterday, uh, eat uh, foie gras, how much uh, money do I want to be saving on a daily basis for a meal? Most probably not too much. So there will be less and less discount information coming into my inbox because the, um, the retailers or, or uh, whichever service providers will know that I am ready to buy more expensive stuff. So getting a view of my refrigerator will have a direct impact on how much money do I have left in the end of the, of the month and how much richer, stronger will they become, the service providers, the good sellers, and what is the, the interconnection between this and their capacity to predict the market and start understanding when is the perfect time for a new cartel. So with the Internet of Things, um, some parts are very difficult to control, uh, this, uh, but will be more or less seen by the consumers and uh, we will be able to continue complaining to the authorities. So if I see that there is only one option where to buy the milk, uh, I will probably have a complaint. But there are some things that are less seen and are very difficult to identify by the authorities alone, and they are related to the IPR. I think that IPR-related issues will become much more topical in competition law than they are today, much more topical, because the requests, continuous requests to get the access to essential patents that you have, if you, if you have the, you're the only one who knows how to make this clever refrigerator, then your competitors will start over time requesting the access to this, uh, to this technology. And uh, then the evaluations of the friend terms, the uh, fair, reasonable, non-discriminatory terms of the cooperation, this will become more and more uh, essential. Uh, of course, this does not mean that the uh, IPR and competition uh, uh, lawyers and economists in smaller countries will start having more work because uh, there will be more and more centralization of major problems 
in the uh, biggest capitals uh, of the world and uh, this is where they will have to do basically the work to solve the problems that we have everywhere. So the African competition law, uh, competition problems will be dependent eventually on how good the uh, Washington authority is doing in applying and finding those, those infringements. Because those IPR, intellectual property rights, will be held there, the, the main licensing agreements will be held there. Now, terms and condition, this is uh, the new type of uh, problem and, uh, by the way, competition law problem uh, that we have now with the evolution of the big data, internet and, and us being online. We all know that nobody reads the terms and conditions, we know all of the practical uh, problems we have with that. Uh, us as consumers, not interesting, because this is not a new thing. Now, what is interesting, that you can use this to create and enforce a cartel. Now, there is a case from a neighboring country, uh, from Lithuania, that went straight to the European Court of Justice. Uh, and uh, this is the Eturus online uh, booking platform, uh, which was used by the travel agencies where they would be uh, offering the, the prices to the consumers. Now, the platform administrator would regularly send in information to be received by the agencies. And the information was uh, seen as, uh, please know that the terms and conditions for the usage of our platform have been updated. Please go read and accept. Now, of course, the agency said yes, yes, yes. Nothing happened. Now, the problem was that in those terms and conditions, they put a cap on the maximum discount that the travel agencies could give to their clients. How cool is that? The cartel is hidden in the terms and conditions plus the updated ones, in the updates, basically. So the competition authority of Lithuania find uh, this uh, Eturas uh, system uh, plus about 30 different travel agencies. And uh, the questions uh, submitted to the uh, Court of Justice were, is that true that by updating these terms and conditions, you can in fact create a cartel? And what it takes to prove that each one of those agencies have in fact uh, taken part of that uh, cartel? Because what if they never read it? What if they didn't care? What if they didn't agree? Now, the Court of Justice uh, was, in my opinion, quite practical and down to earth on this one. And they said, of course, it is not sufficient that you trick people into the cartel by, by a simple uh, legalistic word. Okay? So there must be uh, more objective, more systemic proof uh, to be submitted that each one of those cartel members were, in fact, they, they, he understood what he was going uh, into. And um, uh, they, there was, of course, uh, uh, at some point, uh, to find a, a presumption of participation in that cartel, but it could have been rebutted uh, by, by the uh, potential cartel members. And in the case when it came back to Lithuanian court, uh, two-thirds of the travel agencies uh, basically escaped uh, the, the application of the fines because the authority could not prove that they knew about those terms or that they actually respected. And some of the agencies, in fact, uh, objected to the applications of those terms. So they had to comply because technically they could not put a higher discount in the system, but they kept objecting. So the conclusion is, read the terms and conditions, even if you're doing business. Second of all, make sure that you object. Standing up and objecting is, I think, still the key thing that competition lawyers uh, can, can ad give adv uh, advice to anybody. Whatever happens, just say, no, I don't agree. Apparently, even online, this is an important uh, point. Now, what other new things uh, we are expecting from, from uh, these big data? What will it, uh, will it bring? What type of changes? You see, historically, competition law was law. Lawyers came, wrote amazing decisions, and they said everything is perfect. Now, 
competition on the market will be great. Everybody will be happy. Now, over time, people understood that this is not sufficient. Lawyers are good, including me, but we are not, we're not good enough. We need to have assistance by economists because competition law is about economics. It's about business. It's about how markets operate. Why do they fail? Should, will they fail tomorrow? Without the economic modeling, you, you, can't, you can't really go any further. This is not true competition law application if you don't understand economics. Now, even that has already become the past. Lawyers and economists are not sufficient. IT is the third profession that a true amazing, most amazing competition practitioner should be. The example is the latest uh, Google case. If uh, you remember last year, Google was fined by, for about 2 billion euros for the online shopping um, problem that they created themselves. Uh, and uh, this summer, uh, they were fined um, with another 4 billion euros uh, for creating uh, a system whereby it's, uh, the Android uh, platform has artificially become uh, dominant in Europe. In Europe, it, uh, Google has about 80% of the market. Now, where does this IT problem become, uh, start? This IT problem can be shown when we look at the uh, beautiful uh, picture that is uh, prepared by the European Commission. This is the part of the press release. This is how they explain to us, the consumers, what was the problem? And the problem is called the Android forks. Who knows what are forks? It took me quite a long time to understand what, what is this word, that this, is, this actually refers to some technical problems. Then you go online, then you try to understand what that is. And then the commission has analyzed those Android forks which is a technical uh, issue of how do you develop additional uh, uh, features of, of, the, of the programs, the how you can use this, uh, this Android uh, platform. Uh, and uh, this is very technical. You have to understand, do, is really the conduct of Google that bad for the innovation, for the proper functioning of the devices? Is this a necessary uh, limitation that they were imposing not to use the forks unless they are uh, agreed uh, with Google? We don't know how much IT uh, knowledge was spent there. Another point where IT knowledge, very in-depth, very qualitative uh, analysis will be required is when the new forms of cartels uh, will be analyzed because so with so much information <coughs> available online, uh, some of the businesses rely on artificial intelligence in order to systemically, every day, every, every hour even sometimes, update their own price lists. So the machines are designed to react correctly to the general changes on the market with prices, with, with terms and conditions. Now, what is this code that is uh, making these machines work? What are the rules that are put into that code to keep the prices as close to the competitors, to not go down too much? What is it uh, that, that, uh, that is hidden there? If, if you show me this code, of course I will, will not understand it. If you show this code to the uh, to an average, uh, even most clever uh, authority uh, employee, most probably they will also not be able to find this, this, this key thing. So IT is a must for this uh, future of the competition authorities, practitioners, and uh, sometimes even the, the businesses will have to, um, in fact, educate their IT personnel to know what are the limitations of competition law because uh, the management does not necessarily know what is the program that the IT person is developing and if the IT guys don't know that cartels are bad, that fixing of pricing is bad, then we're in trouble. But this is uh, an averted but still um, a problem. 
So where does it all uh, go and, and, and uh, what are those, those risks and fears that, that, that we have? Uh, from the point of view of uh, what is the right to do business, I think it is very, very important that we are capable of predicting what are the rules that uh, the, near, the nearest future uh, will bring. We need to know which are the points of risk that the companies must check. Even if you're dominant, you have the right to know whether or not you're acting legally, lawfully, and, and whether or not this will change in the next two years. So overreaction to big data questions uh, is not necessarily a good point. Overly scaring uh, ourselves of the potential growth of the market powers uh, by, by those some holders of exclusive big data is also not a necessary thing. Because if we're too afraid of them becoming big and dominant, what can we do? We can start talking about regulatory uh, interference into the market. And this is what some are in fact uh, discussing. They're saying that we should limit this, we should limit that, you should divide this, you should sell this. And and this is becoming too much. The, the, uh, the different types of authorities, including those who have absolutely no idea of how the business operates, they want to say what those entities cannot do and how their business should not be developed. Of course, in some cases, that will be right. Uh, but in other cases, the, the message will be sent to the world that if you want to innovate, if you want to grow, if you want to do something amazing, then probably think twice. You will end up being the most, uh, the richest person on the planet and then somebody will come and say, please sell everything, you're too big. Am I bad? No, you're not bad, but you're just too big. Stop it. So, my conclusion and my um, feeling as of today is that big data is very, very interesting. There will be interesting questions, but those questions uh, should be analyzed very carefully, very calmly. We should not be rushing into uh, drafting a new PhD th uh, thesis on how everything will, be, will change. We should not rush and adopt new laws, new restrictions. We will take care of that as soon as we un finally understand what big data is. Because let's be honest, we don't entirely know what it is and what are those potential problems. Let's sit and wait, be very careful not to uh, allow the big problems, but in general, these are interesting times and uh, let's not become too lazy when the Technics does everything for us, the fridge, the cooking, the machine and everything. Thank you. Thank you, Yulia. Thank you, Peter. Uh, we'll be taking questions. Any questions? Surely there must be some questions. Mark. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, this is really sort of more of a general comment, but uh, your conversation about the uh, internet of things and about making life simpler for those of us who remember what things were like um, before we had all of these devices to simplify our lives uh, probably a majority would conclude that life was much simpler before we had things to simplify our lives and if i have to have a password for my refrigerator and my microwave and everything <laughs> else and i'm going to be answering dozens of emails uh, from my light bulbs telling me when they need to be changed i'm not so sure that it's really going to make life simpler and sometimes i sort of feel that if i could explain what our lives are like today and i could go back in a time machine to the 1970s and i could tell people uh, who are listening to messages about how wonderful things will be when our lives are made simpler and I tell them how we, you know, one out of three people get up in the middle of the night to check their emails and how you wake up in the morning and have, you know, 50 messages for, with attachments that have to be read before lunchtime. And uh, I'm not so sure that the people back then, they, they might just say, okay, I'd like to have a microwave, but please stop there. <laughs> so <laughs> so I, I just, you know, as, as this uh, m sort of process of uh, 
modernization sort of takes over our lives. I, I wonder if you just might comment on, you know, what this is really going to mean for our lives when, you know, this big data sort of becomes an internet of things and, and everything we do is, is sort of taken in this direction. I, th I think that generally uh, you're of course right because uh, especially the, the the example with the passwords uh, this this skills uh, but the development of the microwaves uh, while it sometimes complicates our lives uh, in, in real terms I think is very important because it allows the same companies uh, to use that profit they have received from the super smart microwaves and to probably invest it into something that uh, is actually of real, real importance. What if the guys become really rich and then they start thinking, let's fund the um, research on finding the cure from cancer? I'm not saying this is necessarily what happens, uh, but sometimes when they, uh, while creating the microwave, they, they find out something very important. I hope that people uh, that are investing in the innovations are still interested in this general good, um, but who knows? Who knows where, where, where we will end up with that? But I share your concerns that, that life is effectively becoming strange. Strange. <laughs>